Hey, my name is Larry. I want to welcome you to the live stream. Thank you for showing up. If it's Sunday for you or if it's a different day for somewhere around the world, thank you for coming. Um, I've been a licensed contractor for over two decades. It's my hope that we will um, help the homeowner to educate, uh, maybe to give them confidence to start doing their own home improvements, save some money, um, maybe not have to hire so many contractors all the time. Right now, some of the new people are probably being served ads, so we're waiting for that to end, and, um, and then we'll get going. Okay, let's jump right into with some content. Um, okay, so this is going to be some common house defects that we run into, but if you have any questions, let me know. Hold on one moment. Okay. Okay, let's jump into some content. Okay, so this is going to be common house defects. Um, I also do a lot of home inspections in addition to uh, general contractor work. Like I've said, I've been licensed for over two decades. My name is Larry. Again, if you didn't catch that earlier, let me know if I can help you in any which way. Okay, so this house from the front, from the curb appeal, looks fantastic, right? In the picture, I hope you can see that. But if you walk on the back of the shed dormer, that's what it actually looks like up top. That's called rolled roofing. So rolled roof roofing comes in three-foot wide strips. Typically does not last as long as shingles. It's kind of a lower-grade roofing. You'll often see a near-flat roof. So um, on a near-flat roof, you can't put shingles because there'll be issues with possibly ice damming or backing up if the water or the melting snow does not drain fast enough. So you have to use rolled roofing. That's a common issue. But rolled roofing does not last as long as shingles, so that is what it looks like as it is aging and wearing away. If you can see that, I could even make it a little bit larger. Um, the material is actually getting cracks in it and, and completely decaying. So that roof is basically shot up top. It will need another, another roof. Okay, let's zoom on to another one. Okay, this one. I have seen this one before. Way, way too many layers of shingles. So in my state, in the Midwest, the code is no more than two layers of roofing shingles is allowed. Um, I will tell you, uh, one is best. One is best practice. So the manufacturers will always recommend no more than one layer of shingles. One allows the composite roofing shingles to lay down nice and flat, and it will last its longest. That's how you give it the best chance to last longest. Roofs are, of course, very, very expensive. You want them to last a very, very long time. So some people, when it comes for the second roof, they want to save a little bit of money, which is fair. I understand that. I get that for sure. Um, they will say, let's not strip off the shingles, let's put a second layer on. Uh, building code where I'm from does allow that, but the second layer likely won't last as long as the first layer. It doesn't have that nice flat substrate. It will tend to have uh, uneven waviness, so it won't last as long. Now in the picture, you have way, way too many layers going on there. Um, so... Uh, it will void the manufacturer's warranty and it will definitely not last as long. Um, okay, we have a quick question. A, I know this is about a home repair, but I have, uh, how to do a fixed flat tire. Okay, so to twist on the screws, flat tire, I'm embarrassed, bro. Uh, definitely not expert with car repairs. Um, I have, how to do a fixed flat tire. Screws on the tire. Okay. I have seen some people on the wrenches, they're turning them, that they need uh, more leverage. So they actually will put a pipe over the wrench to make that longer, to extend that longer, if that makes sense. Um, and that will enable them to get more, more torque on that wrench. So if you need more strength, you can make that pipe longer, that wrench longer, and you'll get more torque on that. So you can twist it on or twist it off. Thank you for the question. Okay, back to the common house defects. Um, okay, so this one, um, oh yeah, back to the roof real quick. Uh, so you, best practice is one layer, don't go more than one layer. If it's a budget job and you are willing to accept the rest, two layers in most building codes is allowed. Don't go three. Don't go three or more. You just stop. Don't do it. It's way, way too much weight on the roof. Um, 
Uh, yeah, you will have cracked rafters, snow load problems, so you don't want to do that. Okay, on the exterior of the house, the siding on this one has been neglected for years. So if you do have wood exterior, which is this is wood siding, um, you got to keep the paint, of course, in good shape. And that's why it's not popular anymore. And everybody's going to vinyl siding. Um, it's been that way for decades. Um, so this house, the paint was neglected for years, and you're starting to get some water damage. Um, and it's possibly beyond hope because if you start to pay a handyman or contractor to replace all these individual pieces along the bottom it's just going to be very very expensive um, so watch out for that keep the exteriors in good shape if you don't keep the water out uh, it's terrible for your house the water is the largest destroyer of your house and properties it's always related to water whether it's a roof leak plumbing leak siding damage leaks around the doors and windows basement crawl space it's always related to water water seems to be the source of all evil when you're maintaining your properties okay on this one uh water damage again so that condition uh, may be called spalling it's where you're getting moisture behind the masonry and the bricks it freezes overnight and the water expands and cracks and then you're getting structural damage um, so keep the exterior in good shape keep that water shutting away okay so this picture is from a basement situation. Now, depending on what part of the country um, or world you're watching from, you may or may not have basements. I'm in the Midwest, we have tons of basements. We have majority basements for sure. And sometimes what will happen is with soil pressure and uh, excessive soil pressure, it's called hydraulic pressure. So the water will build up with the soil and that pressure buckles the wall. So if you look at the picture, the steel uh, structure is straight edges and the wall actually has bowed right in has a curve to it bowed right in so that's a foundation structural problem it can devalue the house quickly it will scare off a lot of buyers they don't want to hear the word foundation problems so in this picture they did pay somebody to put in steel bracing to help with that if you have a concrete block foundation and you have horizontal cracks that's a telltale sign that you have foundation shifting and movement and, and it is the bad one that's the one that you don't want uh, then you need some kind of structural repair uh, this one is not a do-it-yourself this one is um, a professional for sure okay this is a deck pulling off a house um, i love on this channel to say you can do it yourself hey i bet you can do it yourself that's what i say at the end of every video but on a deck pulling away from the house like this. It's a no-go that was amateurly installed. It was never secured properly the first time, so now you have um, the risk of literally danger where the deck falls off, shears right off the house, and um, somebody gets hurt or injured. Okay, uh, this one, I don't know if I've seen this exact one. I've definitely seen water damage under sliding uh, doors, steps, and stoops. Anything that approaches the house is a high likelihood for water damage and water history. This is some kind of uh, water pipe. Um, let me see what they're saying about the issue related to headers exterior. I'm not sure what I think it's just because it's open to the exterior um, it's not sealed here so you're going to get all sorts of water damage rot structural damage and then the mice and everything else will come in <laughs> it all kind of goes downhill from there absolutely okay now on the garage okay if you look carefully the door is still relatively square but the opening in the frame is not so the garage is actually listing over um, so that's structural damage um, you want to get to the inside of the garage and see what's going on. If you're the homeowner living with a garage like that, what happens is it occurs so slowly over the years that you won't even perceive it. You won't notice it. So you want to look with a fresh pair of eyes if somebody comments to you that it doesn't look quite right. Be attentive to that. Now, if you're a home buyer or paying a home inspector to look at something like that, they, they should catch it. Um, but yeah, if you're living, I've seen it a lot, uh, maybe with middle age and older older people too. Uh, the damage will happen so slowly that they won't perceive it. They'll think it's just normal. Okay, so this is a sloping floor. Um, they're using uh, quarters on their level to show how much off it is. So that's an inch and a half or more that the floor is off level. Now, we don't know what distance that is. Is that over um, a 20-foot span, like a large family room, which is uh, more acceptable if it's a large span but if it's just like a kitchen or a bedroom or a smaller area that's that's a huge amount of drop off in it and it definitely can be a major major issue 
Okay, let's take a pause on those home defect common pictures that we see, and let's pop over to this one. Um, this one is Bob Vila. So Bob Vila, in case you don't know, um, has been around the home improvement DIY space forever. In fact, I think he's just about the OG or the original home improvement DIY educator teaching homeowners how to do their own repairs. Before him, I believe there was pretty much nobody. I think his show started in the 1970s. Um, so he's a huge advocate for educating homeowners and doing their own repair. Now, this article that he put out was called... 25 easy home repairs you should never pay somebody else to do. Um, I'll take a little bit of issue with that title because some people just aren't comfortable with doing their own repairs, and I get it, but that's what educational videos are for. That's what YouTube is for. Um, even though I'm a licensed contractor, I am totally cool with people paying a professional to fix their home or educate them. Uh, so it's up to you, but let's go through this list. So again, the premise is these are repairs that a homeowner should not pay to somebody else to do. One, silencing a squeaky door hinge. Okay, that's under the category of maintenance, not a repair. Um, we have lots of maintenance items on a house like uh, mowing the grass or washing the windows or siding or cleaning gutters. So it, that's up to you how much extra disposable income you have if you're paying for maintenance. But obviously anybody could probably figure out how to stop a squeaky hinge. Replacing aging electrical outlets. So this one, a lot of people say they don't touch electricity. I hear that all the time. I don't touch electricity. I don't do electricity. So that would include them changing out like a broken broken light switch or outlet or wanting a new light fixture installed in the room. Um, I get it if that's some somebody like you saying you're not going to not gonna touch electrical, but um, it is something with just a little bit of education, you can do the basics. I'm, I'm telling you, and if you've seen any of our videos, changing out like, um, yeah, rewiring a whole house, I get it, I get it. And depending on the state, you might not even be able to do that per code. Uh, in, in most states, if you are the legal homeowner, you can uh, do your own work, but in some states you cannot. It depends on the category of the of the scope of the work. Um, where I'm from, you can absolutely do your own work in the state I'm in. Um, so you could do your own electrical work, including uh, certainly the simple stuff. Now it still has to meet code, so people get confused by that. They're like, "I'm the homeowner. I can do my own work. It's a free country." Yes, in most states legally you can do the own work, your own work, but it is still supposed to meet code. So you're not just doing whatever. Changing out a basic broken light switch, outlet, a new light, uh, you know, common almost everyday electrical components like that. I think a lot of simple do-it-yourselfers could do that for sure. Homeowners, some will feel comfortable with it, some won't, but I would encourage you to try it. Um, hey, I bet you can do it yourself. There you go. There you go. Let's build something Okay, awesome. let's build something awesome. Let's get to work. All right, repairing holes in drywall. Um, if you're constantly hiring out for that or touch-ups, that can be annoying. Uh, but it, that's a skill that you can definitely do yourself, especially if they're small, easy holes. A lot of times people will wait until they're repainting a room to do that one. But, um, but that one you can definitely do yourself. I would encourage you to try that one yourself. If it's a real fast setting uh, kind of thing, there's uh, the product called Fast Mud. By the way, the drywall repair compound, everybody calls it mud, even though it's compound. Everybody calls it mud. But uh, the fast setting mud is called hot mud uh, in the trades. And that's anything that will set like in uh, five minutes to 50 minutes. Um, and then they can uh, sand it off, scrape it off flat, and maybe paint the same day. Uh, traditional drywall mud, it's going to need to dry probably, depending on the temperature and humidity, it's probably going to take about 24 hours to dry in between coats. And um, and then you're going to sand it off. Or you can use a damp sponge. A damp sponge is a lot better than sanding. When you dry sand drywall compound, of course, fine dust gets everywhere. And then it's in your carpets and in your heating ducts. And it, it can be a, a breathing issue for your lungs. So... Uh, a damp sponge is probably even better for sanding joint compound. But yeah, I would encourage you to do that one. If you're, if you're doing drywall repair as a homeowner, the only way to get better is to practice, is to practice. Uh, you'll get better each time, I'll tell you that. Okay, stop a running toilet. Um, everybody knows the old trick on this one, perhaps, where you take off the tank cover and you, you bend the, uh, the float mechanism up because it was running constantly. But if it's anything beyond that, they want to call a plumber. Um, a plumber to, quote, rebuild a toilet um, on their invoice, that's what it will say, is rebuild a toilet will charge 
$150 to $300 to, quote, rebuild a toilet. Now, what they're doing there, if you can see that in the picture, they are um, changing out the interior parts in the tank. So it's the uh, float mechanism uh, that turns off the fill valve. It's the flapper at the bottom and uh, and the fill valve, and I think that's it. So it's a kit that you can buy yourself at all the home improvement stores, Lowe's, Home Depot, Menards, they all sell it, and you're probably only like $15 to $25 for a toilet tank kit. You can put the new parts in there, do it yourself, and it will operate like a brand new toilet, I'm telling you. If that... If that one you feel comfortable doing yourself, you should do it, and you can save an absolute ton of money. Plumbers are known to be very, very expensive for sure. Um, so yeah, uh, fix your own toilets if you can. Uh, let me know if you have any questions on that one. Uh, tub, troubleshooting furnace issues. So a lot of homeowners are going to feel like that's beyond the scope of, of, of their work, their capability. Um, on a basic gas furnace, a real common defect is the uh, flame sensor. Uh, we actually have a video of it. A flame sensor um, will corrode, go bad over time, and then the furnace just won't operate correctly or will short circuit. Um, so you want to keep an eye out for that. So if you know what's wrong with the furnace and you call for service or you, you can order the part yourself, yeah, of course, you'll save tons and tons of money. Um, but most homeowners aren't going to feel comfortable diagnosing their own furnace issues, uh, capable um, or work on it. So mo that, I don't think that's unrealistic. Love Bob Vila to death, but I think that one's unreal unrealistic. Most homeowners are not going to do their own furnace work. Okay. Opening a clog drain. I think as a homeowner, this one, you're probably going to sadly have to learn at some point how to uh, unclog a drain. Um, hold on one moment. Okay. Uh, unclogging a drain. That can be as simple as pulling some hair, gunk, soap scum out of a bathroom drain, pouring uh, the famous products like Drano and those other chemical products. And if you follow instructions, you'll have some amount of success, I'm sure. Uh, but a lot of times it's more than that, and you might may have to buy some tools. Uh, the, the tool you see there in the picture is called a snake um, auger. Uh, I guess most people call it a snake, but it's it's an auger. There's manual and there's power modes. Now, if you call a professional company, a drain cleaning company, Rotor Rooter, uh, Drain Monkeys, there's several. Um, they will charge you a lot of money and come out and clean your drains. Uh, but it is a contractor in your house, and it can be a messy proposition. Um, but yeah, so most homeowners, I would encourage you that one. You're probably going to have to learn some amount of comfort to learn how to uh, unclog your own drains at some point. Uh, unclog the garbage disposal. If you don't know, at the bottom of a garbage disposal, there's a slot right in the center of the bottom, a circular slot that you can put an Allen wrench up there. And as you start to turn that, it will break that free. That's the most common defect that it kind of freezes up rusted solid. There's also a electrical um, reset button under there on a disposal. I don't have a picture handy, but a, a reset button where you can push and that would just start it back up too. So disposals, check it for power. For some reason, it might have gotten plugged or the switch isn't working. Uh, check that reset button underneath. There's always a little reset button, little red square reset button. And then lastly, put that Allen wrench underneath, find the, the center hole underneath, and you should be able to kind of jog it back and forth, get it turning again, it should open right up. So that's a, that's a common one. You really don't need to call a professional for that one. Replacing window screens. Um, there's a couple simple tools you'll need to replace your own window screens. Um, the spline is the supplies is a little roller device and, and a utility knife um it can it can be pretty cheap to do it yourself but uh i tell you our local uh paint and glass company in town here if you take off the screen and drive it to them and say rescreen this for me it is incredibly cheap like a lot of homeowners may feel like that's not even worth their time uh, just pay somebody to do it but if you do want to save money you can just drive it in drive the uh, torn screens to the window company and just have them do it and they'll uh, tell you when they're ready and pick them back up so you can still save a ton of money there by doing the uh, the labor taking the screens to the supplier lubricating sticky windows uh, yeah i guess most homeowners uh, would do that that is in the um, category of 
maintenance. So basic maintenance, um, keeping your house clean and working well, uh, that's the best way to keep the value up, of course. Um, that's still in the category of maintenance. So most homeowners would, would do something like that themselves. Okay, again, if you just joined us, this is the list that Bob Vila put out saying no homeowner should ever pay for these repairs. They're saying you should always just do this yourself. But we're recognizing that a lot of people aren't comfortable with doing, are not comfortable with doing their own repairs. So um, I love to educate DIYers, help them become more confident. But um, if you want to hire a professional, um, of course, that's your option too. Clean faucet aerators. Okay, aerators. In case you don't know, under each faucet, you can see in the picture there, there is that screen device. Now, if you unscrew that device, and usually it's stuck, uh, so it's hard to get off. But if you unscrew it, and sometimes you have to put a little piece of rubber or a little uh, pliers or channel locks just to get it loose. But once it goes, it will just unscrew. And you take it off like in the picture, that screen will be all clogged, gummed up, uh, hard water deposits will be in there. It'll often be kind of orangey if you have hard water deposits. Um, you can turn it then upside down and just flush it out or drop it in a cup of CLR, which is the chemical cleaner for hard rust and deposits, and it will clean right up and you'll be doing fine and you'll screw it back in, you'll be back in business. So that one is super, super easy to do. The hardest thing is to, to get it off if it's stuck. Uh, switching out an old light fixture, that goes back to the electrical comment from earlier. Uh, a lot of homeowners are not comfortable with doing their own electrical work. Um, but I would encourage you to try it. Uh, turn off the circuit breaker, put a little tester up there to verify that you have the correct circuit turned off, or just turn off the whole house. Just turn off the whole house, and then you can uh, drop out the old light fixture, put up the new one. Um, light fixtures, for the most part, are not expensive at all. If you do have to pay an electrician to install a new light fixture, um, I know we have at least one or two videos up right now on the channel to do a light fixture. It's hundreds of dollars, and the light fixture, like for a basic bedroom light fixture, may have only cost you 40 or $50, so a lot more in labor than you'll pay for the part. So, yeah, I'd encourage you to do that one yourself for sure. Hey, I bet you can do it yourself. Okay, leaky faucets. That one, if you call a plumber, it will be expensive. A uh, plumber won't even drive out to your house for less than 100 bucks. Now, um, it depends where it's leaking from. So there in the picture, they are pulling out the cartridge. So most modern faucets, you're not dealing so much with little washers and tiny little parts. They have this, this circular cartridge device. They got channel locks on there in the picture, and they're going to back that out and likely just throw that device away, uh, that cartridge, go, or run down to the home improvement store and buy a replacement that's uh, fitted for that brand. And you'll just screw it right back in and put the faucet together, and it works perfectly, and there's no leak. So um, there are actually a lot easier to service than you think. I'd encourage you to, to, to do that one yourself. Hey, I bet you can do it yourself. Okay, replacing old caulk. Yeah, uh, probably that's maintenance again, but between tubs and showers um, or tubs and, and tile, anytime you have a, a gap or a seam, um, if water is getting back there, it's going to cause nothing but problems. Again, water is the cause of all problems in homes, so you do want to keep the caulk in good, good shape. So yeah, scrape off the old stuff, clean the surface with mineral spirits or any other cleaner, and then properly apply the caulk. If you want that perfect look at the end, maybe wet your finger and kind of smooth it out. Um, practice makes perfect. Uh, your first one will maybe not look great, but as you get more experience, it will, it will definitely look much, much better. Okay. And the next one is uh, sensing squeaky floors. Now that can be easy or difficult depending on your access, how big of a squeaky floor. So, so access. So if it's a squeaky floor, like on the main floor of a house and underneath a crawl space or basement, you have access to it. Here in the picture, they're using, oh, they found the exact squeak location. Maybe they had somebody upstairs, somebody underneath the home, maybe a cell phone was on and they find the exact squeak location. So here in the picture, they took wood glue or construction adhesive. They put it on the shim. They're tapping on that little gap between the subfloor right there and the floor joist right there. Tap that shim in place. When it dries and hardens, that should take the flex out of the floor, squeak stops. Now, what if you don't have access underneath? What if you can't find the location? What if there's a finished basement underneath? What if there's a heat duct, electrical wires in your way? There could be lots of obstructions in your way where you don't have access. Then it gets more complicated for sure. You could be rolling up carpets and then uh, putting new subfloor screws down or something like that. So that one can go either way. That one might be quite difficult. Um, it would just depend. 
every situation be different on that one. Improve, improve central airflow. So here they're talking about changing out a filter. I'm sure, obviously, every homeowner probably can replace a filter. Um, what I like to tell people, when you open it up by your furnace or AC, just snap a picture of the existing filter and go to, go to buy the replacement at the home improvement store. Um, the size will be clearly marked on there. You want to make sure that it fits properly. And then you have some choices at the home improvement store, um, commonly called the MERV rating. So the higher the MERV rating, the less air it's going to flow through there, the better the filtration, meaning you're going to have cleaner air, less smells and odors and that kind of thing. But it can be harder on the equipment. Um, a cheap air filter will let everything through. It's almost doing nothing. Your furnace and AC can still be getting dirty. So there's there's a middle ground there. You don't necessarily need the most expensive. Definitely don't want the cheapest, though, there. Um, okay, caulk, fill driveway cracks. Yeah, that's a good one. Any kind of uh, flat work concrete that has cracks in sidewalks or driveways, um, it will eventually... Uh, get water damage and start to sink and maybe have a possible trip hazard there. So clean out the crack properly. If it's large, you're going to have to put some kind of uh, filler in there. Um, foam back or rod is what it's called. And then, and then you're going to caulk and fill that maybe a self-leveling uh, sealant, but that one, that one definitely can be done by a homeowner for sure. Repainting walls. Okay. So that's, that's classic, right? Everybody likes to paint. Well, I actually hate the paint. I like the transformation that paint does. So it is probably the easiest, cheapest way to change the way your room and house feels with new paint. I mean, it changes your mood and your attitude. I understand that and I get that and I like and appreciate that. But the process, I don't like. It, I, I, I like other parts. I like building stuff. I like framing. I like electrical um, I like feeling like I'm making rapid progress. Uh, painting, I think, is too slow sometimes for me. But um, but that one is is a classic homeowner special. Yeah, do your own painting um, unless you're just too busy or if it's a whole house, uh, that, that's a daunting task. Um, swapping out regular light fixtures and dimmers. So we already had electrical question earlier. Um, yeah, most homeowners, I think, with basic amount of knowledge can switch out simple things like light switches, outlets, and... Uh, a light fixture. Um, and if you're not comfortable, even after watching YouTube videos, uh, and maybe invite a friend over uh, that's done it before and they can kind of walk you through it. You'll just need just a little bit of confidence boost and you'll actually be surprised how easy it is. I don't have electrical wire. Oh, here's one back here. Um, so residential household electrical wiring. There's only going to be three wires. Now, if you're an old house, there's only going to be two wires. So it's even simpler yet. But most Modern houses since the 60s, black, which is your hot, white is your neutral, and uh, the ground is the bare copper. And you don't even have to remember that. You just have to know the color coded. So the black will go on one side of the outlet and the light switch. The white will go on the other and then the ground. And likely, likely when you put that all back together, um, you won't have to know any of that because you'll just be replicating what you pulled out of the wall, out of the box. The old switch that's broken, the old outlets that's broken, or the old light fixture that's just plain ugly, you'll likely be just replicating the connections from that. So you could pull that apart after you turn off the power, snap a picture of that with your cell phone, and just the new one gets hooked up the exact same way. So yeah, I'd encourage you to do, do that one yourself. Um, here's a pretty good outlet. This is a 20 amp uh, safety, oh uh, no, uh, standard outlet. But um, But yeah, when you look at the back of an outlet, let me see right there. You're always going to have gold screws. That's where the black wire goes. And then um, I used to call that silver where the white wire goes. And somebody, I think somebody corrected me. They, they called it a different color, but <laughs> gold is black. Silver is white. That's where the wire connections go. And then green in electrical, green always means, let me show that. Green always means ground. So green is safety. Whenever you see a ground screw or anything green on an electrical device, that's safety. That is where the ground goes. And again, black wire on the gold and white wire on the silver. I bet you got that. Okay. And then the fixing a fridge that isn't cooling. Um, I imagine if we read the article, they're going to say that's just like vacuuming off the coils in the back or doing something simple with that or defrosting the freezer. 
most people, it's not going to work. It's probably something serious like the compressor is uh, broken and you need a new compressor or something pretty serious. So most homeowners probably aren't going to tackle that one. Unfortunately, so many appliances, kitchen appliances, washers and dryers, seems like they're now disposable. Um, even some very expensive brands out there, they just seem like they just won't last and people end up uh, throwing them away as soon as they have an issue with them. Patching leaking gutters, uh, yeah, that's maintenance, but that can definitely be a homeowner, although we introduced now at a ladder work. Ladder work uh, is dangerous. Um, I think if we had an ER doctor uh, or ED doctor, I think they call them now, here they would say falling from a ladder is one of the most common home improvement injuries they see, and it can be extremely serious. So if you're not comfortable with being on the ladder, no matter how tall your gutters are, um, probably don't do the ladder work and have somebody else clean out your gutters and um, patch the leaky gutters. That man is holding a caulk gun. They do make caulk specifically rated for gutters. They make caulk rated for everything. So I'll start reading those labels and you'll, you'll see that. Reviving dying grass. Yeah, okay, watering your own grass. In my house, we put in sprinkler systems and uh, my life got a whole lot better. You know, you're going to the control, excuse me, you're going to the control panel and um, and you're you're setting that timer and you're setting it and forgetting it. But uh, yeah, grass maintenance um, can be homeowner special for sure. Repairing decaying deck, water damage on a deck super super common. That's why wood is uh, going away uh, for the finished wood, the railings and the planks that you walk on slowly going away. Of course, composite is taking over the market. If you don't know that term, composite decking is a man-made product. It does not have wood in it, so there's no maintenance long term. Um, you know, you're not having to paint or stain it every few years. It's not going to rot and decay, so it's going to last a lot, lot longer. Now, the first generation of uh, deck composite decking, it was not as strong as wood, so you ended up with weird sagging between the joist and people the consumer started to repel against it and they thought something was horribly horribly wrong um, it was actually just a normal characteristic of that product it's gotten better for sure uh, composite decks look absolutely beautiful um, they cost a little bit more than wood but if you're replacing your your deck you want to go with composite so it's maintenance free absolutely patching ceiling cracks um, back to the drywall work earlier, we had drywall work there. A lot of people are not going to feel comfortable doing a hole in the drywall if it's large or if they have popcorn ceiling, you know, that spray on texture product. Um, so yeah, uh, you could hire that one out and often painters are an excellent source for recommending drywall repair guys. If you need a handyman service for that, uh, weatherproofing drafty windows, uh, yep, that can be homeowner special for sure. I don't think there's any area where you can injure yourself doing that one. If you're on the inside, if you're working on a ladder, be careful. And then unclogging leaking pipes. Um, there, that was already, there are some repeats in this list, isn't there? That was already in there earlier. Um, yeah, that can be homeowner special. Uh, here they're taking a basic trap apart underneath a bathroom sink. Likely that looks like an inch and a half, um, inch and a quarter here and then inch and a half here. Uh, yeah, you could just take apart that trap and see why it's all gummed up and see if you can improve, improve that leak. Um, okay, back to... Okay, let me pop this on here real quick. And back to the common defects. So this is what contractors and home inspectors see all the time. So we've switched categories. We've switched from easy homeowner repairs that, uh, that Bob Vila says a homeowner should never pay for. And now we're switching over to serious, serious defects. So it's getting more, more intense. So this is structural damage that occurs. The house is clearly, clearly sagging and settling. That's, that's pretty, pretty expense, extensive. And that can be, uh, many, many things that can be uh, structural damage of the foundation, um, wood floor joists, termite damage. A lot of times in an older home, you'll see that kind of movement near the center of the home. So the center is kind of the weakest spot for the walls and for the floor structural system because your perimeter of your house is supported by the foundation, the footers that the foundation sits on. That's the strongest part of your house is the perimeter exterior wall is likely also holding up the roof. The center of the house has some kind of beam and post system, some kind of spanned system if it's not a concrete slab. So they tend to settle and sag a lot more in the middle of the house for sure. Um, 
And then electrical problems, bare exposed wires outside, we see that a lot. Okay, and then, okay, so this one, this is an old electrical service panel. This is the main electrical service panel in this house. Um, there's a couple old ones that you do want to stay away from that are, are more severe than just like a 30-year-old panel. Uh, there's Federal Pacific Stab Lock. Um, there's Pushmatic. I think that's the Federal Pacific Stab Lock there in the picture. Uh, there's a few others that most electricians are going to say, okay, this one's way too old and antiquated. I can't get parts for it anymore. Or if I can, a circuit breaker, a replica part for something like that might be a hundred to $200 for one circuit breaker. Now a modern electrical panel, if you go to Home Depot or so, I want to say you're five or 10 bucks for a basic square D home line series, uh, GE, just the basic everyday circuit breakers. So um, no need to pay for the, the old antiquated outdated ones. Time to just update it, that electrical panel for sure. Uh, HVAC, um, <laughs> it's missing. If you look carefully, they remove the louvers to look at the subfloor. The heating run or AC run or both. Is just missing. They're actually looking right into the crawl space. So something happened. They took it apart or somebody did an addition or remodel and never put it back together. Uh, fireplace issues. So this fireplace was a wood burner originally. Gas has been installed. That's the pipe here with the, with the shutoff valve. That's commonly called a Dante valve. Um, they converted to gas, but probably not Per code, I see soft copper here, and it's pretty small. And then this key, uh, a kid could blow up the house if they don't know what they're doing. If they turn on the gas supply, there's really no safety device other than hiding the key and just praying that a kid doesn't find it. Um, so yeah, that can be that can be a safety situation for sure. That probably was an unlicensed conversion of a fireplace there. And then this, if you know water heaters, you're laughing right now. If you're a plumber, you're laughing right now. But this one makes no sense whatsoever. This. Temperature pressure release valve off a water heater. By federal law, water heaters have to have a temp temperature pressure release valve so your water heater doesn't overheat or doesn't explode. Not to scare you, but water heaters build up, build up a fair amount of pressure with all that temperature and pressure inside. So these valves will be set to release, just like a tea kettle, to release if it's over a certain temperature. I want to say like 160 degrees or a certain pressure. Well, here it probably was dripping or leaking. So some homeowner did some kind of weird connection back to his uh, his cold water feed. Uh, that's a weird one. Don't do that. That violated every uh, manufacturer's warranty and safety and common sense. Don't do that one. Um, so yeah, definitely with doing your own work on home improvement projects, there is a, a aspect of safety that um that you want to take seriously i think when you're doing your own repairs that's that's you know is it is it a new learning curve for you and is there no large safety component to it but if there is then you want to take more time go slower and learn more about it awesome with that said we do want to grow the stream over time so please remind people to come on with their home improvement questions we will be every sunday evening 6 p.m eastern standard time see you in one week guys looking forward to it hey i bet you can do it yourself okay let's build something awesome let's get to work